Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this session. Oh, I need to press the button. Hopefully this is the right session. I'm going to talk about the profile synchronization uh, capability and mostly about how to get this guy up and running. And depending on how we do for time, we'll also cover some additional considerations. Um, my name is Spence Harbour. I won't spend too long on this slide. It's not really important. Um, we are very restricted for time. Um, it's very difficult to actually do this subject justice in just under an hour. Um, so I'm not going to spend too long on the slides. We'll just cover you know, very briefly the problem space uh, that this service relates to, i.e. what problems it's trying to solve. We'll talk a little bit about where this capability came from. We'll look at a very kind of high level, 30,000 foot view of the architecture of the system. And then effectively we'll go into a demo, which fingers crossed we'll walk through showing how to set it up and how to use it. So the slide deck's not going to be much use to you. It's really just kind of to jog your memory afterwards, perhaps. And during the presentation, there will be some pauses where we're waiting for SharePoint to do its thing. That would be the time for any questions um, on this subject. So the problem space is really about user attributes. Unless we are incredibly lucky, we are never going to be working in a greenfield deployment where we can control everything. And certainly in the enterprise, data about users or their attributes, so even things as simple as their telephone number, their address, the department they work in, and so on, are stored across a multitude of different systems. And there's some listed here on the slide, so you know, we hope that Active Directory is going to contain some things, probably the, certainly the email address and the logon name and so on. But it's very common for other attributes to be coming from other places. Two reasons for that. One is Active Directory is sometimes not trusted to be the authoritative store for things like a personnel ID. That's usually going to be in a HR system. Um, and also, another consideration is that in the grand scheme of things, Active Directory is quite new. And very few organizations have been able to effectively take all of the data from these places that already existed before Active Directory was put in and moved to AD. And also, a lot of these systems don't have the ability to use Active Directory as that source. So the end result is that there's a lot of stuff all over the place uh, related to users. And if we're building applications on SharePoint, we want to make use of those attributes, either within cu in custom applications or indeed within you know, the, the core workloads of the SharePoint product, we need a, a, a meta directory, effectively, a cache of that data that we can then use. And of course, the SharePoint user profiles themselves, end users can add information in there as well. And these, these attributes, and therefore the user profile service application, are fundamentally the underpinning of many of the other application services in the product. So you can't get the most, you know, you can't get 100% feature fidelity um, in Ness, this guy is populated. And of course, there's an associated consideration here because if this data is out of date or incorrect, then of course everything that relies on it is also incorrect and out of date. So we used to have user profile import uh, in the previous version of the product. In fact, the two previous versions of the product both effectively did the same thing. And really what they did, and this isn't the code, right? so don't worry about that, but it's not that far off the code. We're basically doing a, um, an ADSI call um, to a particular container in the directory, and then we'll loop through the results and then create them in the profile database. And so this is very quick and is very simple. But of course, this only gives us a one-way import of the data. So the, one, the number one customer request in terms of user, uh, the user profile capability across both the, the previous versions, in fact, was to be able to write back changes to the properties that users made inside SharePoint to Active Directory. So the product group made a choice here that in the 20, 2010 release, we provide a lightweight identity management capability, and that's what the user profile sync service is all about. Behind the scenes, it's actually leveraging a product that already does this called Forefront Identity Manager. So we bundle a version of that inside SharePoint. 
but it is a lightweight version. So in terms of where this guy came from, originally back in about 99, it might have even been 1998, there was a product called Zoomit Via, and this was the meta directory product that they offered, and that, that was acquired by Microsoft. Um, the main reason they actually acquired the company was not the product, it was a, a gentleman called Kim Cameron, who is now the identity lead at Microsoft. So this guy was then rebranded to Microsoft Meta Directory Services. Um, basically, you, this was free as long as you engaged MCS to come in and do the deployment for you. So it was actually a pretty costly undertaking. It was then renamed IIS, Identity Integration Server, and they realized they already had something else with the same name, so they changed it again to ILM. And then now it's been assimilated into Forefront. And fundamentally, the capability is exactly the same as what we had all the way back um, in 1998. The technologies are different. Uh, many more things are in this than were in the first one, but the, the core uh, meta directory product is the same. And you will see in the demo and when you're working with the product, you'll see all these acronyms you know, in the event logs and in the ULS and in various other places within the system. This is a couple of screenshots just for comedy value of the Zoomit Via product. It's all very NT4, but we have over here, point it's not going to work out there. Uh, at the top, there's the known universe, and we have an NT4 domain, a network tree, and a local computer as well. And then these are the user properties for the Craig user. So, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's all very kind of old school user interface, but it's exactly the same sort of thing that we will see in the demonstration later. Okay, so very briefly talk about the architecture components here. This is the user profile subsystem or the user profile service application. The service application itself is just a logical concept. It doesn't mean anything. Um, it's really this piece in the middle and that's really responsible for the configuration settings. The stuff that actually does the heavy lifting, the work, is these two service instances. This one over here called user profile and this one over here, which is called User Profile Sync. So we'll spend most of our time talking about this guy in this session. Just want to point this gun, one out here. The User Profile Service instance is not a Windows service. It's just some .NET assemblies on the machine and a few other bits and pieces. But there is, of course, a Windows service called the User Profile Service. And that's responsible for handling logon requests onto the server. So if you're troubleshooting this and you, you uh, are binging for you know, assistance and somebody says, you know, change the credentials of the uh, user profile service, for example, don't do that because that's the Windows service and nobody will be able to log on to the machine. So we're going to focus in on this guy. And you can see the service instance is actually a wrapper for two Windows services, Forefront Identity Manager and then the Forefront Identity Manager synchronization. The other elements are important, but that's not, they're not, you know, we don't have time to go into the overall service app. We're just talking about the, the, the synchronization piece. But basically what happens is we pull in information from our source directory, and it ends up in this guy down here called the SyncDB, which is our metaverse or meta directory. And then Finn will also sync with the profile DB. And so that's where our, the end result of the data will, will be. So this guy is just a staging area, a temporary staging area for the data. And this is one of the reasons why it's so much slower than 2007. Because we're actually doing a lot of tasks that if we just want to do profile import are not actually necessary, but they are necessary to do um, synchronization type activities. So just a quick note on the two kind of versions of FIM that there are. SharePoint bundles um, its own version, if you like, of FIM. And whilst it's called user profile synchronization, it doesn't actually do synchronization. It will either import data from Active Directory or it will export data to Active Directory. It doesn't do full synchronization. Um, it's also crippled in a number of key ways 
You can't add management agents. Don't worry about what they are for now. We'll see that in the demo. But basically what this means is if we want to perform synchronization with some unsupported source, we can't go and buy a management agent from somebody and plug it in. That will break your supportability. And it will also probably not work in most cases. And also, we are restricted to the changes. Uh, the changes that we make are restricted to um, what we can do within central admin or the, cent the service application management pages. So we can't fiddle around in the other tools that are on the machine. They're installed on the machine, but uh, if we make changes in there, that again will break our supportability. And then there's this full version of sort of another product that you can purchase called uh, FIM 2010. And this does a bunch of other things apart from synchronization, like self-service password management and so on. If you're interested in some of those things, perhaps go along to uh, Rick Taylor's session on identity uh, later in the week. But this, in terms of synchronization, we can do import and export at the same property at the same time. So if it gets changed in AD, it'll get updated in SharePoint and vice versa. And this was quite common um, to see this deployed alongside sh uh, SharePoint 2007, especially in large enterprises. Um, but unfortunately, the product doesn't include a management agent for SharePoint. So you can't just take it, install it, and configure it because there is no MA for SharePoint. You could go and buy one from Oxford Computer Group, as an example. There's three or four vendors that sell them. But that would then be not supported. So even though we have this option in central administration, and you probably can't read this, but it says enable external identity manager, if you click that button, you are unsupported. So don't be clicking it. Don't ask me why it's not grayed out. It's a disabled, you know, on the, on the combo box or whatever. But uh, yeah, so if you want full sync right now, you cannot have it and be supported. So these are the sources that we can sync with. Um, Active Directory uh, 2003 and above. It will not work with Windows 2000 functional level Active Directory. There's no, there's no hacks you can do to make it work. It simply doesn't work. And then we have um, a, a few uh, kind of legacy LDAP based services. Um, and you can see really the only key difference here is Active Directory is the only one with which we can synchronize groups. So if you're wanting to do audiences based on group membership uh, in eDirectory, for example, that simply will not work. If you want to do those kind of things, you have to be using AD. Um, and of course, there's one missing here, which would be quite useful. The thing that used to be called ADAM, or AD Lightweight Directory Services, is missing from the list. So um, there is a, an approach to do this, but basically what it means is you have to export that directory as a flat file copy that file to the SharePoint machine that's running UPS, and then uh, configure a, management, a file management agent to suck that in. So you've got to do a lot of additional work if you are using this guy. Also, a very important point to note on the, the free LDAP services. I'm just trying to stop myself saying like you know those names, because um, it kind of makes me feel all dirty. But um, <laughs> the, minimum, the minimum versions there it doesn't mean you can't do, you know, uh, eDirectory 8.9 whenever that ships, right? It's just that's the minimum version that's been tested at the RTM of the product, which is a year ago. Um, so you have to fiddle around with some configuration with all of those, you know, if you go over those, uh, if you go to a later version. Okay, so there's some requirements for setting this up and this is really the meat of the, the presentation is how to get this guy running and, and actually doing something useful for us. For the UPS service, you remember this is a thing on the, the right, uh, the, <laughs> the other right, the left hand side of the diagram, um, this is a, 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 Windows, a collection of Windows services. We must use the farm account to run this guy. Even though we can go into central configuration and change it to another account, that A isn't supported and B doesn't work properly. It must be the farm account. And the reason is because our timer jobs that initiate both the provisioning of the instance itself and the synchronization actions, obviously they're timer jobs, so they run as the farm account. That's the reason why this must be a farm, the farm account. Secondly, <coughs> excuse me, whilst we're provisioning the service, um, 
we must have local administration rights on the machine. So we have to make the farm account the local admin of the box we want to run it on, which is obviously evil, right? We don't want to be doing that. But the thing is, we only have to do it whilst it's being set up. Once it's up and running, you can then remove the farm account from the local admins. We need log on locally. This will actually be granted by default if we do this in a default Windows 2008 domain, but it's very likely you might have a policy in place that changes that behavior, and therefore you would manually have to grant this. And the entire feature is ignorant of the managed account capability, so we have to enter the credentials in. Then we have the sync account. And this is a different account. You shouldn't use the farm account to do this. This is the account that's actually going to go and speak to Active Directory um, to pull back the data. This needs a special permission, which scares everybody, called Replicating Directory Changes. Now, despite this name, this permission does not allow any right, pro any right against AD. It will not make any changes. What this permission allows is the ability to retrieve a change log from the directory. So it's more efficient to obviously be working with a delta than just getting the whole lot every time. But it's quite, this is the stumbling block in most deployments because in 2007, because it's import only and because every account in AD has read rights to every other object by default, you could set it up without having to speak to that scary guy that runs the active directory. Okay? But now we've got to actually go and have a conversation with those guys that are managing AD, and if it's outsourced, you know, it could take three weeks for that change to be made and all the rest of it. But it, there's no way around this. You need this permission. The other thing that crops up a lot is that the, direct, you know, the AD people say, we're not going to give you that because we don't trust that it's not going to make changes. And they need to like, go read a book on Active Directory. But nevertheless, it's a problem that blocks deployments. The other thing is here with this is, you know, you ask for it, you get an email back saying, yep, I've done that. You try your end of things, and it still doesn't work. And then you wait, you know, you go through the motions, and two weeks later you, you find out that he hasn't given you that permission, he's given you something else. So before you start, ask for a screenshot of the permission, make sure it's on the right account, because if that isn't in place, it won't work. And so whatever troubleshooting you do in SharePoint world, is a waste of time and effort. So validate this before you get started. Generally speaking, we require a two-way trust between the farm where the SharePoint machine is located and the environment or the domain where the user accounts are located. There is one scenario where you can get it working with a one-way trust, but it's not going to be a scenario that anybody here will actually be in charge of deploying. So. Go for a two-way trust because that's the supported uh, environment. You must be at Windows 2003 functional level as a minimum. If you are at this level rather than 2008, you must also add this sync account into the pre-Windows 2000 compatible access group. So this is very common. You might be running Windows Server 2008 on your domain controllers, but it's still at the old functional level. And again, if you don't have this, it will not work. And then if we want to export properties as well, we have to grant these two additional um, permissions. So if we want to write, we need to add write permissions to either the OU where our users are contained or perhaps on the attribute itself. So if we only want to allow export of the telephone number, we could actually apply the permission on the attribute itself. And if we want to create new objects, based on new entries in the profile database, we need to create child objects. So this is good because by default, we only do import. There's no writing to AD at all. And these two slides are basically the summary of 80% of the reasons why people struggle with getting this guy running. It's not to say they're the only things that cause trouble. That's not the case by a long shot, but it's the vast majority. Okay. so. I'm going to move into the demonstration and very briefly just describe the environment I have here. It's quite simple. I've got three machines, a domain controller, a SQL server, and a SharePoint machine. 
And I've got two web applications set up already. This one doesn't really matter, but I've called this intranet.contoso.com, and it's running the enterprise wiki site template. Fairly straightforward. And then I have um, the my, my.contoso.com, which is going to be my my site host. Now you can see at the moment I haven't provisioned user profile or user profile sync or any of that stuff. And so I get this error message back saying could not uh, load user profile. That's the expected behavior at this point. Um, I've already created um, a bunch of other things on this machine. Um, this is a very strange resolution. So I've already created some service applications and so on. And we won't spend much time talking about the interaction between the different service apps. But really, if you want to do a real deployment, you're going to definitely need search and manage metadata. And you can see that these are already set up on the machine at the present. So the first thing, oh, and I'll just show you Active Directory. I've got a OU here called SharePoint Users. And in there, there's some good musicians. And there's one musician in particular who's kind of a bit dodgy and you don't really want to be listening to. And his account is disabled. And then um, I have another OU called, uh, well, it's not an OU, it's just the folder, um, where I'm storing all my, <coughs> excuse me, where I'm storing all my service accounts. So you can see in here, the third one down is the farm account. And then the fourth one from the bottom is the sync account. And I've called that SharePoint UPS. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into central admin and services on server. I'm going to scroll down here and find my user profile service. So if you remember, this is the one I was talking about, um, which is just some .NET assemblies. So this one's very straightforward. You just start it. Nothing to it. There's no options or anything. Famous last words, it will fail now. This will take a wee moment because I've been talking uh, for too long and so the thing's gone to sleep. Okay, so that's started. Now I can go ahead and create the service application. It doesn't really matter which order I do this in. I could create the service app first and then start the service instance, but it's a lifestyle choice uh, which way around you do that. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new user profile service application. And it brings up this dialog box. And I'm going to give this guy a name. And we'll call it Contoso UPA. I'm going to use the same application pool that I'm using to host the Manage Metadata service and all the others. Then I'm asked for, the, for those three databases, if you remember on the diagram. It's going to ask me for a name. So I'm going to fix this up because it's obviously a database, right? What else could it be? So I'm going to get rid of that. It's like calling something TBL customers, right? And uh, we'll call it Contoso Profile. So this is where our user profiles are going to be stored. This is the SyncDB, the temporary staging environment. And then the social DB, which is where all that Facebook-style stuff is. I don't care about any of that stuff, but uh, there you go. That's the recycle bin. Um, now, this one here is quite interesting, the profile synchronization instance. Now, on the diagram, it didn't really sort of demonstrate it, but there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the service application and the user profile synchronization service instance. But I haven't got a user profile service, or a user profile sync service instance yet because I haven't got to that point, and I can't do it the other way around. I have to do this before I can create the sync instance. So this is important that you plan for this, especially in a, in a real environment where you've got uh, more machines or if you want to have more than one of these uh, things. And unfortunately, all this is going to do is list all the servers in the farm. You know, it's not going to trim it to the ones that are running uh, profile sync because profile sync isn't running yet, so it's not possible. So it's kind of silly that this is an option uh, creation. Then it's going to ask us for a MySite host. Now, I can leave this blank if I want, and it will proceed. But without a MySite host, certain things like profile deletion will not work. So even if you don't care about MySites, but you do care about profiles, you should always create a MySite host. So that's going to be my.contoso.com. 
And then we've got the usual settings for the my site, so you know, where we're going to actually create the site collections and how we're going to do the addressing uh, of the name. So I'll go ahead and create that. And what's happening now is it's creating those three databases. It's creating some management. Well, it's not creating, but it's kind of uh, lighting up the administration pages in Central Admin to do something useful. Question. No. So anything that I've done, everything I do in this session works with Viva. There's no, there's no requirement for any of this to be doing Kerberos. Okay, so that's created that, and um, unfortunately this page doesn't refresh. How's everybody liking the uh, central admin UI? Finding everything okay? Loving the ribbon? The, the breadcrumbs. Yeah. Didn't think so. So now you can see I have the Contoso UPA and, and I go in here and I can manage this. Now, the important part as far as we're concerned is this box down here where this little sort of pseudo web part is telling us user profile sync is not currently provisioned. So if I wanted to do everything manually and enter the uh, user profile data for my 150,000 users in here, I'm good, right? We can just all go home and uh, that's all we need to worry about. But of course, we want this uh, user profile sync service instance to do the work for us. Let's so just switch over to the SQL server and uh, look at those three databases here at the top. And you can see why I broke my naming conventions, just so it's easier to show them. Here's the profile database. There's a bunch of tables in here. And here's the social database, a bunch of tables in there. But the SyncDB is an empty database. So at this stage, this guy is an empty database. It's the next step that's actually going to populate the schema into this database. So I'm going to go back to um, services on server, he says. Actually, whilst we're doing that, if I refresh this, this should now work because I've created the UPA. And uh, I had zero profiles. Yeah, this will take a while. It's going to automatically create the administrator. I'm logged on as the administrator. It's going to create a site of my site for that. And before it'll do that, it'll also create a profile for us. It actually, it doesn't do that at this stage. It's not until I click my content that it will create the site collection. Okay, because it's the my content that's the actual, the old style my site. The news feed and the profile and this page, if you note from the URL, uh, are common pages across all users. But um, when we go back later, we'll see now one user profile where we had zero before. So now I could go in here and click Start, and it gives us this screen, which everybody knows and loves. Now I could go ahead and fill this in and hit OK, and it wouldn't work, because I must add the farm account, you notice this is the farm account, into the local admins before I do this. So a couple of things to point out here is select the user profile application. This is the other end of that one-to-one -one mapping that I was talking about on the previous screen. And then we enter the password of the farm account. Now, the interesting thing here is if I type this in wrong, it will fail to provision. This page does not validate those credentials before continuing. And as amazing as it might seem, that's the number two reason why this doesn't work. Not because the user did anything wrong in terms of configuring things and setting everything up. It's because they fat-fingered the password here. So as long as you fat-finger it the same way twice, you're good, right? It'll just carry on, and then it'll fail in provisioning because the credentials are incorrect. My credentials are correct, I hope, because you can't see it, right? So there's no way to know. You've just got to trust what you typed. But it, before I proceed, I need to add my user, the farm account, to the local admins of the box. So that's fairly straightforward. We just add it in here. Okay, so 
number one reason is not doing this step <laughs> and then just going for it. Um, so my admin is, my, sorry, my farm account is now an admin, or so it would appear, but it isn't. Because before group write changes in Windows are applied, I must log off and log back on again. Um, and interestingly, this is one place where the SharePoint Health Analyzer is actually useful. So I can bring this guy up, and over here I have rule definitions. And in here, there's one that checks whether the accounts used by application pools or blah, blah, blah are in the local admins group. And that runs daily. So I can run this now, and it'll take a few moments to sort of you know, go through its uh, thing. Is it still running? Okay, it should be finished. So if I go back to central admin, oh, that's interesting. I've not got a warning. I should have a yellow warning here telling me something's wrong. And the reason it doesn't know yet, because I haven't logged off the farm account and logged back on. So I need to do that before continuing. And the easiest way to do this is to restart the timer service on the machine. So restart service, SP timer v4. Simplest and quickest way to do it. If you want to be absolutely 100% guaranteed, then reboot the box. That also means you can go for a coffee or whatever as well. Um, so now if I go back and run that rule again, assuming I haven't done something wrong, when I go back to the main, when, when that's finished, it will be giving me a yellow warning. It should also take a little longer to actually, because it's now creating an entry in the list, right? Okay, so it's finished. And there you go, it's whinging at me. I go in and view, and it's the one that obviously I've just run. So that's a good way to validate first, before you hit start in services on server, make sure you're getting a warning, right? Fairly straightforward. Okay, so now I can go ahead. Hang on a second, uh, Matt. I think it's Matt. Um, assuming I've entered the right password, and I'm going to put it in here again. This should now work. Famous last words. And you can see here that the status is starting. I'm just going to load up... Uh, the ULS here, oops, I'm going to uh, filter this on user profiles and we can actually see behind the scenes what's actually going on. There's a question, Matt. So because you had to finger in that password, you cannot make the farm account? No. Um, the other reasons you can't make the farm account a managed account are slightly strange, but you have to remember how SharePoint's built as a product. You know, SharePoint found, managed accounts is a SharePoint foundation feature. And so, um, but you're correct, you cannot make the farm account, well, the, the farm account is a managed account. There's nothing wrong with it being a managed account, but you can't do password role, right, which is the main reason why you want a managed account in the first place. It's also a problem because I just type that in, and I, but you'll notice that I was over SSL. And most people, you know, you want to put central admin on SSL because otherwise your farm account's going over the, the wire in plain text, available for anybody with, like, uh, you know, any script kiddie toolkit can get that. Um, yeah, and so you don't want to do password role on the farm account because every time that password role comes in, you're going to have to reprovision user profile sync. Anyway, that's a good point. Good question. You can see in here all of the things that are happening, and, and uh, it's you can ignore all of these. This has got nothing to do with, with what I'm doing. Um, but you can see here it's doing a failover check for the database. This stuff was actually added in the uh, December or the February CU. But you can see we're already talking about this old product, right? It says. Uh, oh, MIIS here, and there'll be MMS in there, and all the rest of it. Um, but you can see what it's doing. You know, it's validating that it's running already. Um, here's some ILM stuff, setting up WMI permissions, so on and so forth. Here's one that takes a long time, database, and then it restarts the service, um, and so on. 
But these are the, these, these are the interesting ones. Configuring certificate, configuring registry keys, opening firewall ports. All of these things require local admin permissions. That's why it needs it. So this is like when you install FIM, this is the second half of that process. When we've installed SharePoint, we just put the bits on the box. When we hit start on that previous screen, we do all these things. That's really setting it up. And hopefully, um, it's finished. And there we go. There's the magic uh, event ID, 9i1u, and set up for the name of the service application. <clears throat> I'm sorry? It did, yes. Um, well, if you've got a spec machine like this, it will always take just under three minutes. I've done this quite a few times. Um, I've also, you know, there's been situations where it's taken a lot longer. Um, the thing is, if it goes wrong, it's going to try, at least with RTM, it'll try 14 more times. But if it went wrong the first time, the chances are it's going to go wrong the next 14 times as well, right? And that's why it appears to get stuck on starting, because it's continually retrying, and it's hitting the same blocker. So in more recent releases, the number of attempts has been reduced, and it's also some of the stages that we do up front are actually um, more uh, uh, sort of preparing the ground for us. This one is interesting. This was added in, I can't remember which CU, but these two avoid the event ID free issue um, that's flooding the event log. Because what we do is um, we are actually updating the schema from the previous step. Uh, it's kind of, kind of wacky, but uh, you know, they are, the provisioning process has been improved significantly. Um, if we go back here and I refresh this page, we should now see that the status of the service is started. And if I go to the service application, I should now be able to you know, proceed. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a little link here because you know, the breadcrumb is so awesome. Um, but you can see here, here's my one user profile. Right? That's the administrator one that was created when I went to the my site. And then down here, I've got you know, a synchronization status of idle and so on and so forth. So that's the first stage. You very much think about this as two stages. There's the, you know, the provisioning of the system itself, and then there's uh, you know, what we do in this space, which is all about configuration of the actual sync things, you know, operations. Now, the first thing I recommend you do is you go into configuration sync settings and change these defaults, or at least the first two. So for the very first time you do a sync, you want to sync users only because that will significantly increase the time, uh, decrease the time, sorry, it takes to, uh, to work. And then once you've got your users in, you do another incremental run with groups as well. We don't care about BCS as far as this conversation is concerned, so I'm going to turn that off as well. It's just going to speed things up. I'm not going to speed them up that much, I must say, um, so get your questions ready for in about five minutes' time. Um, and I'm not going to touch this. If I do touch this, basically what happens is it will disable all of the, um, the second section of links in central admin. In the, sorry, in, the, in this page. It will disable all these. So now I want to create a synchronization connection to my Active Directory uh, where my users are at. So this is fairly straightforward. Go in here, create a new connection, and we'll give it a name. I'm not very imaginative. Here's where we can select the types of system that we want to speak to. Um, you can see the idea here. These two is if you have your users in a different domain to your SharePoint server, and we have to create one for each and, and, and wire them up. BDC we can use to add additional uh, values or attributes to existing profiles. And then you've got these three nasty things here that you don't care about. I can, but I don't have time really to cover it in the demo. So if you're interested in that, we can catch up uh, either later on today or at the Ask the Experts. So here we'll enter the name of the forest. Oh, and it's not that. It's contoso.com. Now, interestingly, if my name isn't as simple as this, although in the video, in the keynote, Contoso looked like a pretty sweet IT organization. Not sure I've ever 
you know, work there. Anyway, um, if our domain is actually different from that, in terms it might be, you know, in this case it'd be Contoso, but what if it was partners? So the domain name would be partners, uh, the NetBIOS name would be partners, but the fully qualified name would be partners.contoso.com. In that case, I need to set an attribute on the service application, and I can only do that through PowerShell, and here's the PowerShell that does it. Um, so you can all remember the GUID, right? That's easy enough to remember. So you just type that in, and then you set, you would, in this, this says zero, but in this case you'd set it to one before you create the sync connection. And hopefully in the future this option will be added to the UI. Um, okay, so we can get rid of that. Um, and then here's where we type in how we're going to authenticate. If it's AD, we're always going to be doing Windows authentication. And to the question earlier, you, there's no Kerberos configuration necessary here because we are actually connecting via LDAP. We are not connecting using NTLM or Kerberos. We're doing an LDAP bind here. And then we enter in the account name of the sync account. So if you remember, that was SharePoint UPS and we provide the password. This time, the password is validated when we hit this, bottom, uh, this button, sorry, oops, double entendre, here. Okay, so in order to populate this incredibly scalable combo box thing here, <laughs> right, we need the password. So luckily for me, you know, my, my AD is not representative of any of my customers, so I can just do that. And I'm, that's going to select my OU. Don't ever select the, the domain at the top, because that's just going to give you all your junk, all your test accounts, all your service accounts, everything, you know, all the people that left five years ago and all the rest of it. And this button, never click that either, because it's going to do the same thing. Now, if you do have a more complex domain, you might have to increase the timeout, timeout values of the proxy and the service app. Again, that's done through PowerShell. So I'm going to click in here, and this is going to attempt to save my connection. If I hover over here, I can get rid of this animation um, by clicking it. <laughs> Which is what you always wanted, right? <laughs> and so now it's created my connection. I'm going to go back up here and uh, just look at these other options very briefly. The first one is the timer job for the incremental sync. You cannot schedule the full sync. You wouldn't want to. Um, and so, oh, I'm sorry. This one is disabled by default. So it's set every day, 1 AM for 24 hours, and it's disabled by default. You want to change the schedule, obviously, in line with all the other timer jobs that are running in your environment. Cancel, and I go back to the screen I was on before. So I'll go up here, go back there. We've already seen the settings, so now I'm going to start the, um, the profile sync. And I'll choose a full sync because I haven't done one before. I must do a full sync as the first run. And uh, before I hit OK, I just wanted to show you a few other things I forgot. Here's the event viewer whilst I was provisioning UPS. And in here, there's a bunch of goop related to things like forefront, unable to open database connection. This is one of these expected errors, right? Um, this is OK if you see this, because if you remember those stages, the first thing it was trying to do was see if the database already had stuff in it. That failed, but unfortunately, we get this junk in the event log. Um, but you can ignore some of these, um, and some of them you can't. So this one, for example, can be ignored. Um, so just be a little bit uh, cautious with chasing down problems in here, because they can actually be ignored. And you can see the old name of the product again, and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and start the sync. And if we clear out the ULS, um, and I can load up this thing called the Synchronization Service Manager as well. Here's our management agents, and I mentioned these in, when I was on the slides. <clears throat> For each service application, there's a management agent created. That's this guy, the second one with the GUID, which you can all remember. In fact, it's a different GUID from the one on the PowerShell, but uh, anyway. 
it's a vanity GUID in this case. And uh, when we create a management, uh, when we create, sorry, when we create the user profile service application, we get one of those guys, and that's using a thing called extensible connectivity. So that's the management agent that speaks to SharePoint, or in this case, Moss. And then when we create a sync connection, we get the management agent extension, which is the third one down. And these are the things, these are .NET uh, assemblies which are responsible for you know, talking to the different systems. Also, you might notice that when I provisioned the service, I didn't do an IIS reset, even though the central admin told me to. Well, the reason I didn't need to is because I was talking so long. If you just leave it for a minute, you will be able to manage the, the, the service app directly. Um, also, what I should have done is remove the farm account from the local admins, of course. Right? Now, if I go into, back to my service app, this will hopefully show me down here that it's actually trying to do something. I click on this link and I get this awesome piece of CSS, silver light type design. Um, <laughs> but you can see it's not working. It's not doing anything, right? It's got zeros and stuff, failure. There's, there's zero successes, zero failures. But it's not working. Why is it not working? It's because I haven't granted the replicating directory changes to the UPS account. But this status isn't going to tell me anything useful. Here over in the Forefront Identity Manager client, you can see here the details. Um, and it's running the, trying to run the first stage, and it's going to repeatedly try and run the first stage. But my error details is down here, and it's going to tell me that uh, you know, I've got it misconfigured. And it's not the error I was expecting, but here you can see if it's 8453 and the, the, like the sub details, you can see, oh, I don't have the, the account uh, details I need, or the account doesn't have the permissions I need. So it's fairly straightforward to find out what's going on. You just have to do it in this tool. Now, this tool, you can't make changes in here. That's not supported. But you can use it like I'm doing here to, for troubleshooting purposes. Because don't forget, once we start a sync, we're no longer in SharePoint. We're in FIM. And FIM can't say, hey, SharePoint, I've got a ULS for you, and pump the information back up. Uh, well, it could, but they haven't implemented that. So um, this is where we need to go if we, if we uh, are looking for more information. So whilst that's going to keep trying and fail, uh, well, actually, what I'll do is I'll go over in here and I'll stop that run. Or at least I'll click the stop button. Um, and whilst that's sorting itself out, I'm going to go ahead and grant these permissions. So it's on the domain. It's a change log, remember? So it, we can't just do it on the SharePoint users OU. It has to be on the, the domain. I'm going to, the easiest way to do this is not the only way. But when you're speaking to the AD guy and they don't actually know what the permission is, you might have to send them the instructions. So you right click on the domain, choose delegate control. And then even AD admins need a wizard. So we'll click next. And we'll select the user that we want to grant the permissions to, which is SPUPS. And then we'll choose the second option here, create a custom task to delegate. And then we'll uh, use this top option, this folder, and everything below it. And then we'll scroll down a bit here, and here's the guy we're interested in replicating directory changes. So assuming that you've got the thing running, this is the number one reason why pe uh, people can't sync. Finish that. Now, if our NetBIOS name and our fully qualified name don't match. We also need to do it on the configuration partition. Um, we don't, I don't have time to show you that, but if you need the details, you can get them from the links at the back of the deck, uh, which I'll pop up in a few moments. And uh, so what I can do, do now, hopefully, um, is go ahead and start a full synchronization. And I'll just clear these ones out.
and we'll do another um, profile sync. Whilst this is running, because we're running short on time, I'll flip back to the slides and cover some of the best practices in this space. So we've already covered the first two. Don't try and work around that farm account issue. You know, I can go into configure service accounts and change the UPS service instance to run as, you know, some other account. And you can do that and it might appear to work, assuming it's got all the necessary permissions, but you will not get 100% functionality, plus you'll be unsupported. It's actually considered a bug that that um, service instance shows up in the combo box in that, uh, in that page. Don't use the same account to do, run the service and do the sync because that means then you're doing the sync as the farm account. So always create a dedicated account for each directory service that you are syncing with. As I mentioned, validate these permissions before you start. Right? If you're not in control of Active Directory, which hopefully for, for your sanity's sake you're not, um, you know, make sure you've got proof that these have been done properly before you start with SharePoint. Because if they're not there, you can do whatever you want in SharePoint, it's still not going to work. Also validate the synchronization connection and filters. What I was hoping to show you was I wanted to filter out Kenny G, right? Because um, he's hor you know, it's horrible. Anyway, um, so we need to plan these things and you need to try and validate them before you put them into practice. There's some in interesting uh, things around sync connection filters that can lead to unexpected results. So always validate this stuff, obviously, on a test machine um, before you deploy them for real. Perhaps on a smaller subset of users. If you're trying to sync with 300,000 users, it's going to take a while. So um, you want to test it out on a smaller subset of users first. Document all of these things, the connections, the filters, the mapping, so whether it's an import or export. If you don't have this documented and you're in re restore from backup because of some issues with uh, user profile sync provisioning, i.e. the thing that we saw, there's no easy way for this stuff to be kind of imported and exported. So you've got to make sure you've got this actually documented. Um, there's a few considerations on upgrade as well. If you're doing, um, if you're doing loosely typed hacks in 2007, i.e. changing a date to a string, for example, that won't work. You can't migrate that stuff. You're going to have to rewire that up. Uh, taxonomic properties, you have to rewire that up as well. Try and use as few connections as possible. I've got one connection here, and that's interesting. I never actually used that alt tab. Yeah, there you go. There's the real one. You can see here that it's slow, and I'm in the second stage. Here's my eight, eight objects, by the way, you know, to show you these. It's picking up all the users and the, the hierarchy there. But there's actually eight phases that it's going to go through. And so if I have 10 connections, that's 80 stages. So it might seem obvious, but the duplicate, you know, having connections where they're unnecessary can significantly increase the time it takes to do a sync, which is, unfortunately, um, for this number of users, the sync will take about six minutes. Now, it doesn't mean that 10 users will take 10 minutes. It doesn't go up a curve like that. I could probably do 100 users in the same amount of time, but it is slow. You have to plan for the time it takes to do um, import and uh, sync, uh, export as well. So avoid having like, you know, 150 profile properties per user, for example. Question? Yeah, you can't have a different schedule per connection. So, so that would apply then we're in an environment where what we do for us and doesn't just trust. Yeah. Um, so we will eventually have all these different connections for certain kinds of forests. So when you run the sync once, it's gonna be all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. yeah. That's a reasonably uncommon scenario. I'm not saying it's not there's not a lot of people in that situation, but yeah, that's not... What you would do there in the real world is you wouldn't actually schedule it uh, using the UI. 
you would uh, you can you can kick off those individual connection sync operations uh, behind the scenes outside of the SharePoint management UI, for example. In fact, that would be supported. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. February 2011, but that's for user profile service application. All right, I can't comment on how good or bad that particular update is for any other thing. Well, I can, but I'm not going to in this session. Um, the, you don't want to deploy the December one because that broke some things that, as well as improving things. So fundamentally, the Dece if, I can't give you a real number, but the import speed was hugely reduced in December and, and later. The trouble with the December one is it busted some other things uh, as well. So that's not a good one to deploy. You should also bear in mind that when you deploy a future CU, you will have to reprovision the sync service instance because the, the uh, packaging of the updates is basically you install the bits and then you run psconfig. But psconfig doesn't know about the sync DB. It's not aware of it. So and it, that's why we can't uh, make fixes in, in that respect. And that's why we saw those two uh, items in the ULS there. So here's our stages. You can see I have six ads. And you see it's bringing over all the, all the musicians. Well, uh, five musicians and one pretender. <laughs> um, you can see it hasn't finished yet, but here are the profiles. And I could actually go in here and view them. Oops, wrong. So you can see it's already brought them over. Now, the original idea was to do the demo where, you know, I'd get rid of Kenny because he's kind of lame. And then I would also do an export of the telephone number. But, you know, for time reasons, we just can't do it. It's very difficult, as I said, to do this in an hour. Um, the only other option really is to just do a full demo the whole session. Um, question? Yep, this gentleman at the back. Yeah, you can publish and federate the UPA across farms, but you cannot share it across the WAN. Okay, I'll talk more about that in my service app federation session, but basically you, uh, UPA over the WAN is not supported. And we have a different tool as part of the admin toolkit called the user profile replication engine. So that's how to deal with that kind of scenario. Uh, the reason for that is very important. Well, one of the reasons, I'm sorry, one of the reasons for that is if you notice, despite all this service-oriented goodness of service apps and so on, the consuming web application actually does direct T-SQL to the profile database. So you don't want to be doing that over the WAN uh, for obvious reasons. Um, just whilst we're waiting for, oh, it might have finished. Uh, here we go. No, it's still going. You notice that even though I turned off BDC, it's still going to waste a few seconds doing it, even though I don't have any BDC here. Um, yeah, you've got to either, well, you've got a choice to make there. You kind of clean up those old profiles. Um, or if they're just profiles like the one from my administrator account where there's no attributes, you know, that's okay. Those profiles will be updated with the data from AD, so that might be okay. Um, but if users have actually gone in and entered data and so on, um, you've really got a choice to make there, whether you want to just like throw it away and overwrite it. Um, or you have to do a kind of diff, an exercise of doing a diff between what's in AD and what's in SharePoint and making a choice of which one you want to win for each property, um, which is actually very common in, in identity management projects generally. Um, but that's kind of, that's a, that's a lot of work. It's not complex, but it's, you know, laborious work, especially the more users you've got. So it's very much a, most companies will just choose to throw that away um, 
and the users will have to then go and make the changes again themselves. Um, it really depends on, well, it depends on many things around HR policy about that data and so on and so forth, what, what the right choice to make there is. Um, just going to show you one of the properties very briefly before we finish because I'm causing trouble for the next speaker. I find it amusing that this UI, which underpins the social features in the product, has all got HRs and you know, legacy HTML. But um, this property mapping is where we can set the direction. So at the moment, the display name is being imported from the ACS policy name. Oh, sorry, that's not right. That's the top one on the list. So if I want this to export, you'll notice the direction cannot be changed here, right? I have to remove the property first. Oops. I have to remove the property first and then re-add it with a direction of export. So like I mentioned in the slides, it's import or export. It's not synchronization. You cannot do true sync with this capability. And that's by design, well, semi by design. Uh, that's what I was talking about when I said identity management, you know, light. This is, this is the, the reasoning for that. Oops, that's no good. So with that, I'm out of time. I apologize for not being able to cover as much as perhaps I would have liked in the demo, but hopefully this content has been useful. Um, this uh, link goes to a page on my site where I've got a bunch of articles on this subject that go into way more detail than you can do in an hour. Um, and I'm going to continually add this, add to this content over time, well, as I get time to produce it um, in a way that is appropriate for a broad audience. So keep your eye on here if you're interested. Watch out for the other stuff that's out there. Um, because there's lots of errors in things and lots of misinformation. All of the stuff I publish is, um, it's not official, but I do, a, I go through a process of ensuring that it's validated by other subject matter experts in this space, in this particular kind of like workload. Um, and uh, hopefully this information is sort of useful to you when you go back and deploy this or are troubleshooting things. So thanks very much for staying with me, staying awake, listening to me. Um, enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>